Welcome to Live at Five. This is Friday night. It's our last Live at Five. But tonight we have two very special guests in the studio. We have David and Natalie, and they are going to cover a very wide range of topics. They're going to cover German, Spanish, psychology, sociology, and philosophy. But before we have a chance to talk to them, we're going to uh, watch some films about those subjects to give you an overview, to give you an idea. Uh, but be thinking, if you've got some questions, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we're going to start with Spanish. Okay. So, should we cut to Spanish straight away? I think so. Yeah. yeah let's go with Spanish. Yeah. Hola, chicos, y bienvenidos al español. Uh, thank you very much for your interest in studying Spanish here at Chapel Town Academy with us. Uh, my name is David, I'm the Spanish teacher, and I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes telling you why Spanish is a good A-level option and why you should consider studying it here with us. So, first of all, um, the course, the main part of the course is obviously learning Spanish, the Spanish language, which is a very useful skill to have um, in, in life. Um, obviously, if you go on and study it at university, that would help, um, but later on, or if you don't go to study Spanish at university, it's still a useful skill to have whatever you go on and do after A-levels. So that's the main thing we do, learn the language, which involves bits of grammar, um, bits of uh, speaking, vocab, and we also study the language through certain topics. Um, these are quite varied, are looking at Spanish culture and Spanish history, and also Latin American culture and history. So some of the topics we do are um, racism, uh, the internet, food, different languages in Spain, and uh, a couple of history uh, topics as well. Other than that, we also do a little bit of literature. Uh, there are two books we look at. Uh, one is a short novel written by a Colombian writer, and the other one is a short Spanish play. So we study the language through the literature, and uh, obviously we do that in class. We look at it together, uh, and we analyse these texts as well. And the final bit is a piece of coursework you'll do called an independent research project. And that is a piece of research that you do. You choose a topic in Spanish that you are interested in. It can be anything that you're particularly interested in, literature, history, politics, culture, sport, whatever. And you produce a piece of research on that and a presentation which you give on that topic. So with Spanish, as I say, the main thing is learning the language, which is the most useful skill you'll pick up. Um, but there's also a fair bit of other things that we do as well. So the different topics and the one that you research in great detail yourself, um, something you're interested in is, is often very interesting for people, and also, as I say, a little bit of literature as well. Um, we also look at doing a couple of trips. Um, in the past, we've done a trip to Madrid, another one to Barcelona. So we'd look at doing uh, another one of those again in the future, hopefully. So yeah, um, the other thing to mention is there's a small handout you can have a look at, which is available um, online on our website. I'm just going to quickly look at it now with you. Um, obviously, you can read this at, at your leisure. Um, it tells you the main areas of the course, language, culture, literature, and film. And um, right there at the bottom is my email address. So if you think of any questions after watching this video that you, you'd like to know the answers to, then please do get in touch, and I will uh, answer those for you. So uh, Spanish is a, is a great A level, really picks up a new skill for you, is, interested with, is, is an interesting course with lots of uh, different uh, aspects of Spanish and Hispanic society to look at, as well as literature and your own project on something you're interested in. Um, so if you uh, do have any questions, please get in touch, and I hope to see you uh, here next year. Muchas gracias. Adios. Thanks to David for that interesting overview of Spanish. I feel like taking it myself. Uh, but we're going to hear about another modern foreign, foreign language now. It's German. Hello there. So my name is Louise Reed, and I'm from Chapel Town Academy and I teach German. OK, so what can you expect from German at Chapel Town? Well, you will learn about the culture, the traditions, the hot topics in Germany. For example, you'll learn about the history of the city of Berlin really important. You'll learn about his entertainment in the industry, famous people that have lived there, famous places to visit. Um, you'll also look at famous artists and architects who've had an impact on the history of art and architecture in Germany. And um, you'll also think about things like current affairs. So how does Germany deal with racism? How does Germany deal with immigrants? Um, what's their view on the EU? Do Austria and Switzerland agree with Germany on those things? Um, so you'll, and in particular, you'll look at how Germany's past has affected its present and its potentially its future, thinking particularly of that split between East and West Germany. 
You know, also, aside from the kind of um, curriculum, you get to look at a topic, any topic that you fancy that takes your interest. Um, so something that you're really passionate about that's related to Germany, Austria or Switzerland, you can look at that in more depth, do some research on it, and then you get to actually present that material. Um, so it can be anything. So if you like football, then you could do something on football related to Germany, Austria, Switzerland. And so it's a great opportunity for you to invest some time in the things that you really like um, and learn a little bit more about them. You also get to study a famous film. You might have heard of it, Goodbye Lenin. It's a tragedy and it's a comedy all rolled up into one package. It's got romance. You see how a couple's uh, relationship is tested over the course of the film. And in the context of the fall of the Berlin Wall, you see how the family um, copes with those changes in a very unusual way in some, in some instances. So it's a very, very interesting film and one that I find students usually really enjoy watching. So what would German give you um, on top of all of those things? What skills would it give you? Well, do you know what? They're massive. You will learn to communicate better with other people. You will develop your speaking skills, your analytical skills, your teamwork. At the end of those two years, your confidence in dealing with people um, and also in speaking, analyzing will have grown massively over that time. And you know what? German pairs up really well with subjects like maths, science, uh, engineering. So if you put those together, you've got a really strong combination for a future career. So I hope to see you. <laughs> if you've got any questions, give us a buzz and I'll be happy to talk to you in more detail. Thank you. Thanks to Louise for that uh, overview of German. We've had some questions already coming in um, and we're very pleased to take those questions. Uh, could be on Spanish, German, philosophy, sociology or psychology. I know we've got some coming through already. We're going to hear now about philosophy and it's David again. Hi there and uh, thanks for your interest in studying religious studies here at Chapel Town Academy. My name is David, I'm the religious studies teacher. Uh, firstly, around the academy, you may hear it referred to as philosophy or philosophy, religion and ethics. Uh, the reason for that is um, sometimes people think of religious studies as just being a subject where we look at different religions and examine the Bible and Quran and other religious texts, but it's not like that. So we call it philosophy, we call it philosophy, religion and ethics and religious studies um, in order to give a more accurate representation of what we actually do in this subject. But the A level is the religious studies A level. So what do we do in this subject? And why should you study it here at A-Level? Well, it's a very varied course um, with lots of interesting topics that we look at. And there are three distinct areas. Firstly, philosophy of religion, so philosophy. Secondly, ethics, so working out what is right and wrong and how can we know what right and wrong is. And thirdly, developments in Christian thought, so looking at some Christian ideas and how these have changed over time. Um, there's a handout available on our website for you to look at, um, so I'm just going to go through that now briefly um, here. So some of the questions we look at, philosophy of religion, some of the topics, existence of God, soul, mind and body, and ancient philosoph philosophical influences, which is about Plato and Aristotle, asking questions such as, what is the mind and soul? Uh, does God exist? How can we know if God exists? Uh, things like that. In uh, ethics, we look at uh, things such as business ethics, conscience and utilitarianism, and ask questions like, how do we know what is right and wrong? What do the words right and wrong mean? Um, if bad actions make people happy, uh, does that make them good? And do businesses have a responsibility to the environment, etc.? And finally, uh, in developments in Christian thought, we look at things such as ethnic afterlife and gender in society and ask questions such as, is there a life after death? Are Christian ethics distinctive? And what are Christian responses to changing views on, on gender and gender roles? So there's lots of different topics. These on here are just a, a few of the ones we look at and a few of the questions that we try and answer. Now, I've put a few questions on there because the main part of this subject is asking and answering questions. It's not a subject where there's a right and wrong answer most of the time. The, the, the subject is about discussing different issues and trying to come up with answers to these questions. But obviously your answers can be different to other people's and what is important is to debate and discuss these ideas. So there's no right and wrong answer. The, uh, the, the subject is about your reasoning and arguing and finding your way to some kind of answer. That means that doing this subject means you'll pick up a lot of useful skills, uh, communication skills primarily, both 
articulating your answers and your opinions verbally, but also being able to communicate them in written form as well. And also you learn how to argue, how to construct, formulate, and put across your arguments. So there's useful skills that can be used and, and will be of use to you at university, later on in life, whatever you choose to do after finishing your, your studies here with us. So that's the main reason why I would suggest doing this subject. You pick up useful skills and also you do really interesting topics and it enables you to discuss them with other people and come up with some kind of answers to really intriguing questions. Um, on the handout, right at the bottom, I've put my email address there. So if you do have any questions or anything you, you're not sure about having seen this video, then please do email me and get in touch and I will try and answer those questions for you. So thanks for watching and uh, I hope to see you here next year. All right. So that was David, and you'll have a chance to put any questions you'd like to him um, on modern foreign languages or on philosophy. Just get those questions coming in, that would be great. We're going to hear now from Natalie, who is actually with us in the studio, so you can put questions to her after we've looked at the little short introductions. First of all, sociology. Hi, and welcome to an introductory session on sociology. So what is sociology? To most of you, sociology will be a completely new subject, never studied before. Um, some of you may have done it at GCSE, which will give you a, a slight um, head start. However, it doesn't really make any difference. Um, so what is it? Sociology is the study of human behaviour, but it refers specifically to the, the social behaviour, society, patterns in relationships and social, social interactions, and the culture that surrounds our everyday lives. It is the general science of society, really. So what do we consider? So we consider how social forces influence our actions and whether we truly have the agency to make our own decisions. Are we free or is there some supernatural being that's controlling what we're doing. So society is fluid and ever changing. So the normal of the past is vastly different from the normal of today. You'll, you'll know that from your history lessons. But we reflect on that and we think about societies of the past and, and the structures, for example, patriarchy, gender, gender inequality, different class systems and, and how wealth is distributed, how it was distributed um, historically and today. Um, gender inequality, as I've just mentioned, but we also look at the inequalities among different ethnic groups, which again has been prevalent um, in the media today, but also we consider um, the changes in our behaviours and the change of our world taken for granted and challenging our common sense knowledge. And you can see from what's been going on in recent months in terms of COVID-19 and how that's impacted topics like the family, education, how the things have been portrayed in the media, and these are all things that we're going to consider look at how crimes changed, how now it's a crime to not wear a mask and if you'd have said that to us 12 months ago we'd have, we'd have probably laughed and thought how, how outrageous that can't be true but now it is actually a law um, and we consider the f fluidity of that and the social construction so again we've seen firsthand how society and laws and education and families and beliefs have experienced drastic change and rapid changes over recent months so sociology is about this transformation. So it's about analysing the inequalities in which arise from such circumstances and lead to socialisation, exclusion and poverty amongst particular social groups. So fundamentally of all, it'll allow us to understand ourselves, okay, the ways we think, the ways we behave and feel, indeed our sense of identity and how it is very much socially produced. So we'll look at human nature so it's not something we're born with, but something we obtain. So it's not in the sense that it's something deep, natural, an instinctive thing that's set within us. But for the way that we think and behave and feel is shaped by the process of socialisation, providing us with language, beliefs and values that establishes our identity and transform us in, transforms us into members of society. And what is it that controls that? You can see from this image, this empty vessel of a human being, being filled with things from the TV and other media outlets, filled information from school, from our parents, families, and historically, and less so um, from religion, but in terms of the beliefs that we have and how they shape our actions and our interactions with others, and therefore create our sense of self. Important uh, to consider the um, long-term routes that sociology can lead you to. Lots and lots, and this list here isn't exhaustive, exhaustive by any sense, but gives you an idea of the vast range of, of disciplines and 
fields that you can go into um, when studying sociology and it's important to consider the content but also consider the skills you will become critical reflective sociologists your sociological imagination will be stretched far beyond like i say the common sense understanding of the world that we may have, have followed up to this point and really start allowing to critically reflect on everything uh, which is a very useful and transferable skills if you to go on um, to university in particular but also in in terms of any other field that you would like to study it really does give you a multitude of strengths that set you up of any other um, potential candidates that you will be up against in interview so finally to leave you with some uh, student appraisals so these are from our current students that we have here at Chapel Town and gives you a little bit of an insight firsthand from those that are studying it and, and their views on sociology. So that is very snapshot, very short and sweet, but hopefully it gives you a little bit more of an insight into what sociology is, what you would be expected to, um, to consider and question while studying sociology at A-level. Um, thank you very much for listening um, and I hope to see you soon. We already have some questions in on uh, sociology and about sociology and um, hopefully some coming through as well on modern foreign languages and philosophy. But before we go live to our experts in the studio, let's hear about psychology. Hello, my name is Richard Conson and I teach psychology at Chapel Town Academy. If you're watching this, you're probably asking yourself two questions. Should I do psychology and should I do psychology at Chapel Town Academy? Hopefully, by the end of this, you should be able to make an informed choice. If you are thinking about selecting psychology as one of your A-levels, then you are in very good company. It's the second most popular A-level subject in the country and 65,000 A-level students can't be wrong. Psychology has a big impact on all areas of life, from education and health to the economy and crime. And that's partly why it's so popular among students. Another reason is that it's something new to learn. Most students come to us without a GCSE in psychology, and that's fine because we assume no prior knowledge. To give it a formal definition, psychology is a study of the mind and behaviour. You will be very busy throughout your two years of AQA A-level psychology. There's a lot of content covered in three papers. The content of papers one and two are covered in the first year, and the second year is used to cover paper three. It's planned like that to give us the maximum amount of time for revision and the study of exam technique. The course is 100% examined, so we have to get that right. At Chapel Town Academy, you have psychology staff with decades of experience teaching A-level psychology. So you would be in safe hands. Obviously, that only results in success if coupled with your hard work as well. Psychology is a science, and it's one that many students actually enjoy. Half the marks of paper two are research method marks, which is looking at how the science is carried out. In addition, biopsychology covers some of the content of GCSE and A-level biology. You will also be expected to do some statistics to test research hypotheses. The study of psychology is really diverse, but here are a few of my favorite researchers. Skinner who worked with the military in World War II, training pigeons to guide missiles toward enemy targets using reward and punishments. Milgram, who found that through obedience, 65% of people would be willing to give a 450 volt shock to an innocent stranger. Bowlby, who suggested that infants who were separated from their mothers during the first two years of life would turn into affectionless psychopaths. Murray, who found a link between watching violent TV programmes and brain activity in areas associated with aggression. Behaviourists Watson and Rayner, who wondered if phobias could be learned and thus conditioned an 11 month old boy with absolutely no fears to have a phobia of rats. Einstein, who developed the matching hypothesis, suggesting that people tend to go for a partner with a similar level of attractiveness to themselves rather than always going for the most attractive individuals. The infamous prison experiment by Zimbardo was a study so unethical towards its participants that it had to stop after only six days rather than continuing for its planned two week runtime. Normal everyday people would turn into brutes if split into groups and given power over others. 
Hazen and Shaver researched how attachments as children may affect future relationships. They found that children with secure attachments were best suited to later forming long lasting adult relationships when compared to children with insecure attachments to their caregivers. After A-levels, many of our students go on to study psychology at degree level. To work as a psychologist, you'll also need a postgraduate qualification, so it will take some years, but some of the areas psychologists do work in are shown here. About 25% of psychology graduates end up working as professional psychologists. But psychology graduates are not limited in their choice of careers. With the many transferable skills developed at university, you can often find psychology graduates working in health and social care, marketing and public relations, management and human resources, education, and anywhere in the public sector. You now know what psychology is, what some psychologists do, and what we study in psychology at Chapel Town Academy. I look forward to seeing you next year. All right, welcome back everyone. All of our films are going to be available online, uh, so you can look at them again, check out any that you missed or details that you wanted to refer to. But now we're going to go live in the studio to our two special guests. And with us we have David and we have Natalie. Uh, now David's our specialist in Spanish and German, I'm just checking my list here, and also philosophy and uh, of course Natalie is our specialist in sociology and psychology. So I'm going to start with David, let's kick off with you David. Now I know that you are very passionate about your subjects and sometimes people uh, wonder what is the value of a modern language subject to study at A-level and what might it lead to? How would you answer that question? Oh well, you are, I'm quite passionate, yeah. Uh -huh. The thing about languages is it's, it's a skill you're going to have, uh, and the A level is it's by the end of the A level you have a pretty good knowledge of the language. Uh, you do pretty much all the all the grammar that there is, and if you did it, if you said it first, you wouldn't even have very much of what you've already done. A level you do pretty much all of it, and you'll uh, obviously acquire quite a considerable vocabulary. You'll practice reading, writing, speaking, and listening. The main skills you need to communicate in the language. So at the end of the A level, you will be able to communicate pretty well in, uh, in, in the language that you've chosen to study. So it's a skill that, you know, later on in life is useful, even if you don't want to do languages. And um, having a language is going to help maybe make you more attractive to other employers. If, you know, you're being up against a candidate who doesn't have much language in the you look a little bit more um, attractive to the, to the employer. So it's, it's a skill that will be useful in life, whatever you do. Um, but typically, if you do decide to continue studying languages, the jobs, well, like teaching, of course, and that is interpreting, translation, um, that kind of thing, certain kind of writing involving languages. So, yeah, there's a few fields that you can go into with it with a skill that you can get. I know that one of my, uh, well, actually, several, I'm thinking of one in particular, my English literature students is also doing, uh, she's, she's doing Spanish um, yourself, and um, she, she, she loves it, absolutely loves it, and wants to take the languages on uh, into a future career. It, what sort of subjects go well with languages? English, as you say, definitely, um, because it's also a language. I mean, quite when you study Spanish and learn the grammar, it actually helps improve the knowledge of English grammar. That certainly happened in my case when I was learning Spanish, and I think it's happened in the case of the students of Spanish as well. And also because of, it's part of the, and, and when I say German as well, if you're doing an A level language, you do do the literature. So again, if you're studying English, that will help with the literature side of the course. Although it's not necessary, you can do a language study of literature without doing English. And also, in science, has some essays as well. So any essay-based subject, so that's all yeah, history, philosophy, many, many other subjects require essays, English again, of course, um, politics. Um, so, and also, interestingly, because of the way the language is formed, it, maths and language sounds like an unusual combination, but actually it's reasonably common at the degree level as well. So, yeah, and I would say, say it as a subject it doesn't go well with, um, but those are the ones that come to mind to be particularly um, now, I can't uh, move on to Natalie until I've asked you about philosophy, because I know that you wanted to explain about the ethics side and also the religious studies side. So just explain a little bit about philosophy, David. Yeah, it's a new subject to most students. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, 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 so the area of the study is, is religious studies, but we call it around college philosophy. We also call it philosophy, religion and ethics, because that gives a more accurate representation of what the subject's actually about. Because People who want the religious studies at GCC and, and, and before then you just sit and read the Bible and the Quran and religious texts and, and do look at different religions. But whereas the area is much, much broader than that. So there's, there's three sections. There's philosophy, which is debating and discussing issues 
uh, about the meaning, understanding of life, and things like that. So philosophy related to religion. You look at ethics, which is another third of the, the subject, which is about you know, what's right and wrong. How can we know what's right and wrong? How can we work out what we should do in, in certain situations? And then the other part is the other third. So is looking at uh, Christianity, yes, and the development of Christianity, but discussing things such as what happens after we die and things like that. So often we can't provide an answer, but we certainly discuss these issues and, and try and come up with answers. So yeah, it's much broader than just religion, which is why we often refer to it as philosophy, because that's what most of it actually is. Well, debates, discussions, I know there's a lot of discussions and debates in sociology and psychology, and we've had some questions uh, for you, Natalie, and I'm going to ask you the first one. And the first one is uh, from Bethany, and she's asking if A-level sociology, is it like the GCSE in sociology? Um, there are certain crossovers. Um, so for those students that have, have studied at GCSE, you will look at it, um, have looked at education, families and households, um, and also perspectives like feminism, culturalism and Marxism. So they should certainly be familiar to GCSE sociology. However, at A-level, we do look at it in, in so much more depth, in so much more... Um, Theorists that we will um, study, um, and so many more um, different specialist teachers and different elements to various different topics that we're, we're looking at. Um, so, yes, we will do families again, we will do education, we will do crime deviance, um, beliefs, and uh, research methods, which we will, will be crossover naturally. Um, however, that doesn't go to say that you need GCSE sociology to study it. Um, if anything, it does provide you with a useful foundation and you have got that knowledge there. But ultimately, the nature of the subject is exactly the same as it's still sociology, obviously, but um, it is just at a higher level and um, more detail. And I think it's probably good that they don't necessarily need GCSE sociology yeah. because I don't know how many schools would be able to offer that. Yeah, not many do. It's not a very common subject. Yeah. Well, we have another question here from Emma. Hi, Emma, one of our early Kahoot winners. We've got another Kahoot session, the last one tonight. Um, so, Emma is asking for sociology and psychology. How have previous students performed in exams and how do you prepare students to use exam techniques instead of just covering the content? Um, so students t tend to do very well. Um, obviously it's variable based on the individual students. You can't make um, in general comparisons um, because they're different every year. But students do do very well here um, in both subjects. Um, and in terms of preparation for the exams, that we do lots of exam practice alongside the topics that we study along the way. Um, but we do have isolated exam specific lessons where we focus on exam skills and um, being able to apply our psychological or sociological knowledge to specific um, questions, how to unpick questions um, to make sure that we can, we can provide the very, very best answers possible. So we do have lots of practice throughout the course. Um, and again, like I say, that is, um, as we are looking at content, lots of exam practice there, but also standalone revision and, and exam question specific um, sessions. I think there's a follow-up question actually. Yeah. So it's uh, asking, uh, Emery's asking about, um, uh, no, this is Lex actually, what A levels are good to do alongside psychology for if you want to do psychology at university? Um, I suppose just as David said, that in terms of psychology, I wouldn't say there's any subject that doesn't necessarily go with it. There is quite a lot of mathematical content within um, sociology, so 10%, uh, sorry, psychology, so 10% um, is mathematical uh, content, so maths would certainly complement it. There's a lot of biology within it, so biology would certainly be a good um, subject to run alongside it there. It is another social science, so sociology would be a good one um, as well. Um, it is an essay-based sub subject, so English um, would be a very good one um, to certainly complement it as well. But there are, I think that's very helpful and I think one of the things that we covered uh, on, on other evenings actually when students were asking about particular subjects and how they complement one another is that we do try to really personalise their choices so if they have a particular uh, aspiration to do something later on we try and help them uh, choose the best subjects for that route and I think that's a, certainly a strength that we have and um, we have a question for David and the question is from Emma for philosophy and ethics how do you plan to make your lessons engaging to students and do you need to have done that subject at GCSE uh, absolutely not you don't have to have done that subject at all there's no uh, requirements like that um, how do you make the subjects engaging well but, uh, 
often the topics themselves uh, provoke a, a, a reaction and it, it, students find the topics interesting. Um, so essentially what we do is, you know, we'll outline, well, I'll outline what the, the idea is, what the argument is, what the philosopher says, and the students always come up with um, their own thoughts and ideas. You know, sometimes they'll agree with what's been said, they'll agree with the argument, they'll like it, they'll like what the philosopher says, um, but more often not they will disagree and uh, in my lessons the students tend not to be shy about expressing their disagreement with what the philosopher said which is great. So what the, the subject generally, the, the interest, the engagement comes from the different debates and arguments that we have uh, as we discuss issues and which is what the exam is all about as well, the, the arguing and putting across the point of view and developing an argument and coming to conclusion. Um, and with the subject, it doesn't matter what you argue in the end, whether you feel like an argument or not, whether you like the philosophy or not, it's about constructing an argument and reaching some kind of conclusion. Um, so that's how it, 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 the, the, the early engagement comes from the debates and the discussions that we have on the issues, which tends to happen organically because the students normally always come up with their own ideas and you know, have some kind of reaction to what we're talking about. So yeah, that's, that's where that comes from. Oh, I know you've had some very lively debates. I've managed to see some of those. Uh, and I know the students enjoy them very much. What yeah. about the type of student that you get? Is there a typical philosophy student coming through for you? I wouldn't say we have a particular philosophy student. No, I mean, um, obviously, some people are more more um, willing to express their opinion immediately. Others prefer to think about things and, and take their time. But um, so everyone does eventually, you know, in some way express their opinion, especially when they have to write the essays. Of course, people do develop their own arguments and write their conclusions, etc. So, I as, as, as a particular type, I think you have a and um, the, the, the most the best quality I would want you to have is the desire to understand and learn and find things out and want to find what want to work things out for yourself. Because as I say, you present ideas and then you have to come to your own conclusions. So the desire to find things out for yourself would be the key skill I guess. But so it's that inquiring mind. It's that, that's, that's the best way to put it. Yeah, inquiring mind, yeah. And uh, the same question to you, really, Natalie. Do you have a, a, a particular profile of your psychology or sociology student, or a whole range? Because I know these are popular subjects. They are very, very popular, and uh, lots of research has been undertaken actually about why people pick them, you know, sociology and psychology. Um, and for sociology, I mean, generally looking at and imagining the classes that I, I've taught, it just generally seems to be um, a female um, intake. Um, they, they seem to be the, the greatest number. Not to say that we don't have boys studying it, because we do, but in terms of proportions, we get that, which is actually an interesting um, you know, fact in itself, because we will study that when we look at subject choice and in sociology and understand why subjects, some subjects might be more girls than boys. So um, that in its very nature, that question is very fascinating as a sociologist to one can understand. And a lot of some students say, well, I'm picking it because it's completely new and I want it, it sounds interesting. Um, so I want to take it there. Again, it is about that debate, that inquiry in mind, and trying to take the um, and challenge the taking for granted standard uh, processes of life and really think, oh my God, yeah, that's why that happens. And in terms of psychology, like I say, again, lots of research um, has been carried out into the why students study psychology, and yes, it is a very new subject in, in, um, as it is with sociology. Maybe some people want to and, and like to people watch, and, and that's their hobby, and therefore we can understand <laughs> people greater within that that subject of human behaviour, which is fascinating and so relevant in itself, which is why it makes them so interesting, fascinating subject. People might want to cure themselves if they feel like they've got their own psychological issues. That seems to be um, the, a lot of responses from research that I've, I've read. So fascinating. Um, there certainly seems to be quite an interest in criminology. Yeah. I don't know whether it's because of CSI, but certainly yeah. a great passion for those aspects of forensic yeah. psychology seems to be developing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I always ask students at the very, very beginning um, of the course, why have you picked it and, and um, what, do you en what do you enjoy about what the psychology that you already know? And a lot of students do say, I've got a very strange fascination for like murder mystery, that type program, CSI, like you say. Serial killers is another one. I don't think I should really be terrified <laughs> of the students that I've got in front of me, but um, it is very fascinating, and, and a lot of students that, that I teach at the moment are wanting to go into uh, the criminal justice system, study criminology at all psychology at the university, and it's great that they've got that drive. And we do look at um, kind of aggressive, aggressive behaviour. We don't study um, forensic psychology um, as a singular topic, but we do understand different um, behaviour. Well, as it, as the topic in its very nature, understanding human behaviours and, and what might lead people to have certain personality types and so on. So very, very fascinating. So we do uh, crime and even topic in sociology, um, which students find very interesting. They do, they find that rather fascinating, slightly worryingly. Um, <laughs> I know that um, in uh, English language and literature, as David knows, 
Uh, we do uh, some um, linguistic analysis and we look at forensic linguistics as well, which is really interesting, and how that's used in the uh, analysis of crime also. Uh, but I, I think one of the things that we have noticed coming through uh, in the questions is that students are wanting to find topics that, uh, and subjects and disciplines that complement one another. And I think we would say David, that if you have a passion for one, that's the way to go. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you're going to be studying this a bit in a couple of years, and maybe even further if you do university, of course. So, yeah, it's, it's important to, to enjoy it and to be passionate about it. So, yeah, if you're thinking about what to do, what, what you feel passionate about. And obviously, there's some things you might not have done, like possibly like sociology, perhaps at psychology at DCSC, but if you think it sounds interesting, if you would be involved in it and invest in the subject, then yeah, absolutely. And if, if you're passionate about it and enjoy it, then you're probably going to do better. I mean, people tend to think of philosophy as a highly intellectual subject. Is it very difficult, then? It, it's not. I mean, there's some ideas and concepts that are quite challenging, but we, we go over them in a way that tries to make them make them clear and easier to understand. And then it's about once you've understood it yourself, then, as I mentioned before, about you then formulating and articulating your own opinions and, and arguments based on it. So that can be as however complex as you want it to be. So sometimes these are quite complex, but we make them as simple as we can, and when you're producing your own argument, you can be as complicated or simple as you like about it. Now, on the uh, non-foreign languages side, do you find that um, there is a, a, an interest in the literature aspect? Uh, because there's a, a literature component, isn't there? Absolutely, yeah. And um, there's also a film component. It, you have to do at least, uh, at least one book, and either a book or a film. And I think in Germany, they choose to do a book and a film. I prefer to do two books, because I'm um, a big fan of literature. I prefer to analyse literature. So, Students tend not to select the language because of the literature. You know, they tend to select it because of the language. And also, as well as studying the language, you also study bits of the culture, like the design Spanish, you look at food and languages and a little bit of history and um, racism and the internet and uh, things like a wide range of topics to which we learn the language. We need the topics to study language, reading, listening, writing, speaking, as you said. So um, that's why we tend to choose it, but they're fine. Um, the literature is something that they, they, they learn to enjoy as we go through that. So again, you, you know, do, lots of people do English, which they really like. Uh, so obviously there's a big link there, but if you don't just do English, people tend to still enjoy the literature side of it once they, uh, once they get going with it. So we've had a question now for um, Natalie. Uh, it's a follow-up question from Lex. And it's about uh, the psychology, if it's so popular, do you accept lower grades? And how do the groupings of classes work? Um, it is a very, very popular subject. The groupings um, will work in terms of the other subjects that you pick, so in um, terms of the different. Um, Come on. Well, you run two groups, don't you? Yeah, you well, run two three groups. groups. Three groups. Yeah, three groups. Psychology, yeah. But yeah, it just depends on the block that you fit in and where it fits in with the others in terms of how the groups are formulated. Um, the groups are around um, 20, 18 to 20 in size, and that's all three groups for, for psychology. Sociology, uh, they're a little bit larger, and it just it depends on the popularity and, and where they fit with the other complementary subjects that other students are taking. Um, but yeah, it's a very, very popular subject. And, um, the, like I said, with psychology, there is a, a mathematical content that, that is quite demanding. We do in, influential statistics, statistical analysis, and, and um, that kind of thing. So um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it if you are finding an Maths is really, really difficult and you, can't, you cannot do it. Um, and There's a lot of stats, isn't there? A lot, a lot, a lot yeah. Um, and it's 25% of research methods stuff within it, which is not direct psychological content. So um, we are, I suppose, quite um, not strict, but it is important that you have got a level of understanding, but equally we are um, welcoming and it is a completely new subject, so why would we always you know, use the previous levels? And subjects that are not necessarily directly psychology or sociology and measurement for it and will help you along the way, but it's about finding the right route for you um, and we will support that. Yeah. Absolutely, we always do. Lauren, I think, has joined sorry. us. Yeah, I think, sorry, in with Lex's question was a, a worry that the popularity of the subject might cause the groups to fill. And, right. whether, and it sounds like from what you were saying that there's a decent amount of room across three groups. So. Or you could apply. Yeah, I see. Exactly. Then you're yeah, definitely exactly. going to play yeah. it. Exactly, yeah, it is. Um, I've never known anyone not get on it if they want to be on it, so, so I wouldn't have that worry, really, but certainly, you know, get even the public patient. Yeah, there, and I think that's very much the message from, yeah. from the other nights. We've had a couple of questions about people worried about maybe subjects might be 
full if they were popular, or maybe not run if they were less popular. And it, it, you know, in general, we have been very successful at timetabling things so people do get the chances to do the subjects they want to do. I'm going to Lauren. I haven't forgotten about you, Lauren. Um, what subjects, David, go well with modern foreign languages? Um, so I think with languages, um, any, well, as we do uh, essays, anything that has essay base as well, uh, like what we said, psychology, do essays, don't you? English. Also, history and English, absolutely. English is another language, is another reason. I think you mentioned maths is a good one as well. It sounds a bit odd, maths and languages. Yeah. Sounds I cool. did maths and French myself, so I'm very much on board with the combination. I remember my level teacher said I had a very mathematical approach to languages, so that was learning <laughs> Spanish. So. Yeah, so it's a, uh, it's a popular combination at university that as well, and that's in Spanish. So I would, I would uh, and obviously another language, in fact, Spanish and German would, would go quite well together, so it's quite similar. Um, so I, but I wouldn't say there's anything, but those ones that spring to mind have been the ones that I would say fit most, but I don't think there's anything that wouldn't fit to good, because we have some students do like biology in Spanish, which doesn't sound like a combination you think of, but I think the last three years I've had at least one student doing biology in Spanish, and that seems to work for them, so again, there's nothing that wouldn't go with it. And it was mentioned right at the start, it's a, it's a skill that you have in life. So, whatever the way you do, even if you don't study language later, you've got that skill you can develop and use wherever you go from here. And as Owen mentioned, and, and, and actually as Dale uh, discussed on Monday, we try to be as flexible as possible in terms of helping people get the pathway that they want. Uh, we, we have all sorts of techniques uh, at, at play there in trying to uh, make sure that the timetable will fit with what you would really like to study and what passion you might have. Now we're going to ask the last questions to come in Indeed. because yeah, we've there's got a Cahoot question I've been up. sitting on for a little while. Okay. We can maybe answer whilst anybody uh, puts in any last questions they've got for this. But then, yes, as Brigitte says, we are uh, going to have a go playing Kahoot with you live online as we've done for the last two nights. Last time. Um, Indeed. Uh, so the question we've been sitting on for a little while was we had a general question about if you're not sure about what subjects you're picking and maybe picking three subjects or four subjects. Um, so the, the answer to that really is yes, you can pick four subjects, but uh, do bear in mind that in general people don't tend to take four subjects for their exam. University entry criteria, for example, are very often based on your three grades and taking a fourth subject all the way to the exam uh, often sort of dilutes your effort there a little bit. So you absolutely can take four subjects here, particularly if there's a good reason why you wouldn't want to try four subjects. But a lot of people who do so would then reduce back to three subjects, either very shortly when they feel like they've made an informed choice or potentially at the end of their first year. I think that would be the normal pattern, yes. So what I'd like to ask both of you then is, what advice would you give to a student who's considering taking your subjects but they're not quite sure? What advice would you give? Let's start with you, Natalie. Um, if, well, if you're not quite sure but you've got that little spark um, within you somewhere, then as I just said, if, it, if you've got a three that you want to do and you might want to consider sociology or psychology as a fourth, then just do it and try it. And if you don't like it, then you don't have to do it. Do it. But you never want to be asking yourself, oh, what if, what if? So at least certainly give it a go and, and keep your toe in the water. Um, and see what you think, and there's no rebuttal if you don't like doing it. And that not just goes for my subjects, but anything in general. Um, I think it's important to at least give it a go. Absolutely. And David, same question to you. Well, not the same, I'll start with the same answer. Yes, I'd agree with that. Try it. I don't like it. You can always go down to three, as we said. Also, I'd say if, if in the meantime you're, not, you're thinking about Spanish, of course, you're not quite sure, and you've got some doubts. Make, drop the email. Um, I think our email address is on the website. So if you're not, if you've got a specific doubt that you're not something you're not certain about, why you're thinking about the right for you, drop the email, ask me, and I can hopefully try and answer that query for you. Um, but if not, yeah, give it a go. And finally, why uh, would you suggest that a student should apply to come here to, to study your subject or others? As a college, as a um, as Chapel Town Academy, as an educational institution, I think the fact that it is um, so personal, so intimate, and it's very, it's much smaller than maybe the larger colleges across the city, is very much a characteristic that I'm drawn to it as a, as a teacher here. Um, but also, I know a lot of students like that. We, it's very personable. We all know each other. I know students I don't even teach. Um, which is very, very nice and friendly in its nature, which makes you settle in better and makes you feel so much more comfortable. So I, I certainly think that's a favourable characteristic of, of the place and it's certainly unique. Most 
most definitely, most definitely. And David, I know that uh, students feel that they do get that personal support. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm happy to say, because we're quite small, we, we can do that. Um, to say it's like a family is a bit of a cliche, but it's not, not entirely accurate. It's, it's certainly some truth to that. So we, we do offer personal support, yes. As Matthew says, we offer no teacher, no teacher or even inform you to know people because it would require a small school. We do offer personal support. I think we're teachers are all approachable and available to help students out when they need it, even if you teach someone who's still available to help. So yeah, I think we do offer that personal support to our students and we do have a nice atmosphere around the place when you can come to the which you can pick as a student, I think, and yeah, as a teacher, certainly. And we want our students to enjoy their time here, don't we? we? Certainly do, yeah. Well, we've enjoyed our time with you tonight, and we'd like to say a big thank you to you, David, and to you, Natalie. Yes, thank you very much. For answering all those difficult <laughs> questions. I know you're not staying for Kahoot, so uh, goodbye and thank you. And any further questions that come through, we'll make sure that we pass them on to you. Brilliant. And in a moment, we're going to cut to a little slide to show you all of our socials whilst we make some changes in the studio and set up ready for Kahoot. Um, but just to say, if you are joining us for Kahoot, do make sure that you are completely up to date with the stream in terms of stream delay. If you've paused or rewinded bits, make sure you're fully up to the current time. And you will need both a device to watch on and a device to play along on. So that might be two separate tabs on your laptop or watching the stream on a screen whilst playing along on your mobile phone. Uh, so we'll cut to our socials for you guys to keep in touch after this week. And uh, once again, thank you to our live studio guests. Many thanks. All right, welcome back everyone. Welcome back. So, uh, we're ready for round one of tonight's Kahoot quiz, which is a general knowledge round. Uh, so, the game pin is up on screen for you guys to log in via your devices. Again, uh, everybody's been absolutely lovely for the past few nights, so we haven't had to deal with anybody with any funny on-screen names or anything of that kind. And in fact, we've had some lovely competitive quizzing as well. It's been uh, lovely to see. A lot of talent. Lovely. We've got a couple of our regular competitors joining us. <laughs> Hi, Emma. Hi, Annabelle. Yeah. And we'll give people a decent amount of time because I'm aware stream delay is a thing. We've got different subjects on tonight. So we really don't know exactly how many of the logged in users watching on stream are also able to play along in Kahoot. So we'll give it a decent amount of time for people to join us. If you do miss round one, you can join us for round two and round three. And the prizes are awarded by a random selection of who wins round one, round two, and round three. So if you miss out on a round, you still have the chance to win the prize. Hi, Jess. Hi, Lucy. Mm -hmm. Excellent. We're still getting a couple of people come in, so I'm quite happy to be patient for a couple of <laughs> seconds longer and let anybody else join us that's joining us. Welcome, Lex. So we're going to have three rounds tonight. We're going to have a general knowledge round, as you should always have in a quiz. Uh, I'm, the middle round, I like to do some questions that are relevant to tonight's stuff. So I've written a couple of modern foreign languages questions for you. And then we're going to finish with an entertainment round. So sort of films, pop music, TV, that sort of stuff. I think we've probably got everybody who's able to join us. So shall we start I think we should go one? for it. Let's go for Excellent. it. Excellent. So welcome, everyone. Enjoy the quizzing. And question one is, Halberd 
is which of the following? Is it a breed of duck, a traditional southern surname, a medieval weapon, or a style of facial hair? So which of those is a halberd? And do remember that the fastest answers score the most points in Kahoot. So you are against the clock a little bit. Ah, very well done. <laughs> well so done. two people getting that correct and uh, a couple of my red herrings catching some people out. <laughs> Shall we see how that's affected the scores? It's a medieval weapon, of course it is. Okay, excellent scores there from both Emma and Lex. I think 1,800 points is about the most you could get with stream delay because you get your an opportunity to answer instantaneously on Kahoot, but you get a bit of stream delay watching along on YouTube. So those are some very competitive scores, but still four questions left of this round, so everything to play for. Let's have a look at question two. So which of the following is not a current Olympic sport? Football, table tennis, field hockey, or half marathon? One of those is not a, an Olympic sport. But which one? Indeed. Okay, a little spread of answers there. I tried to pick some weird sports or sports that people aren't quite sure about, but the half marathon is typically not run as a competitive distance. People run it a lot, a lot more recreationally. Let's have a look at how that's affected the scores. Oh, well done, Lex, taking the lead there, but still very much everything to play for for everyone. We've got three questions left this round. Let's have a look at question three. Which of these dancers is in three time? Is it a waltz, a Charleston, a rumba, or a Paso Doble? Impressive. Oh, very impressive, impressive indeed. Lots of dancers. Yeah. I think this is the popularity of Strictly on I the think telly. I might be right. <laughs> yeah. But there's still the uh, fastest finger first to see who's got the most points on that one. Let's see how it's affected the scoreboard. Oh. Mm. Excellent. So still everything to play for, but some really good quizzing tonight. Fantastic. Let's see what question four has to offer. A variant of a gallop where two hooves hit the ground simultaneously is, is it a canter, a trot, a walk, or a run? So for a horse, which of these is a variant of a gallop where two hooves hit the ground at the same time? Wow. Oh, canter. Again, all five correct Very answers. Well done. Very, Very well, well, done well done indeed. So again, let's have a look how that's affected our scores. Leaderboard unchanged, but everybody you're really really scoring very highly again. And we've got one question left. You guys know I like to make question five <laughs> a toughie. So let's see, uh, let's see how this one goes. What does the WD in WD40 stand for? Is it water displacement, work degreaser, William Denby, or Wheel Deluxe. So the famous product WD-40, what does the WD stand for? That is hard, I mean. It's tough. I do like to go big for question five <laughs> each round. Wow, a lot of people getting that correct. I'm I wonder impressed. if we've got any of the scientists from a few nights ago. So WD-40 famously is a lubricant, but it actually lubricates by getting rid of the water that makes things stick together. Um, so very well done. Let's see. Let's see who's won. So in third place we have Jess. Well done, Jess. In second place we have Lex. Well done, Lex. And in first place, Emma. Well Woo! done. Well done, Emma. <laughs> Okay, let's quickly cut back to the studio for a moment whilst I set up for the next round. Okay. 
Right then, our game pin is being broadcast on screen, and this second round is themed after tonight's subject content. So uh, those of you that are interested in modern foreign languages might have a bit of an advantage, but as with the sport round a few nights ago, I tried to go a little bit weird and a little bit unusual, just to make sure the non-subject experts have got as much chance as the subject experts. Excellent. I think that's everybody we had last yes. round, so should we get going? Yeah, go for it. Excellent. Right. So, Modern Foreign Languages Round on Modern Foreign Languages Night. And, well, and indeed Sociology and Philosophy and Psychology. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Which of these is a well-known German word? Is it A, B, C, or D? This is literally my favourite question I've ever written. A, B, C, or D? Lots of correct answers there. D is German for the. I did have to check very carefully that none of the others actually were German words. Let's see how that's affected the scores. Mm, some very fast responses there. I, I didn't think people could get up to 1900 points with stream delay, so Emma and Lucy in particular, you must have answered very quickly there, and Jess and Annabelle quick answering as well. Really well done, everyone. So, question two. Which of these is a French greeting? Is it salut, bonjour, felin matin, or joie de vivre? opportunity for me to use my A level in French. I was there. impressed with your accent there. Mm. Uh, lots of correct answers there. Salut is indeed a greeting. Bonjour means good cabbage. <laughs> Felin matin means cat-like morning. And joie de vivre it is a French phrase, but it's for joy of life. It's not a greeting. So as usual, let's see how that's affected the points. See who was quickest. Mm, a few people changing places there, and it's very competitive, as always. Got some good quizzes, but Lucy taking an early lead there. Well done, everyone. Let's see how question three goes for you. So, other than German, three of the following are official languages of Switzerland. Which is not? So, is Spanish not? French not? Italian not? or Romance, not an official language of Switzerland. Mm, a little bit spread there. Um, I thought I might catch people out with Romance, which is a, an official language, but not one many people have heard of. Spanish is not an official language of Switzerland. So let's see who got that one right. Ah, well done, Lex. Climbing a few places. You know, really negligible difference in score between the top two. And in fact, the t uh, well, I think anybody can still win it. Um, and particularly the top yep. four. Yep. Top four, really close. Question four. Adidas is a brand originating from Germany, Spain, France, or Italy. Which of those is Adidas from? I am impressed. Wow, yes, I did indeed. Not, yeah, I like, did not know this until I researched this question. <laughs> uh, it's actually uh, after the, the, the uh, original owner, Adi Dassler, it's his name. Uh, so let's see how that's affected the scores. Look at that. Wow. Isn't that close? I'm impressed, very impressed. Yeah. Everything to play for on question five. Good luck, everyone. Oh, is this your tough one again, Owen? Oh, yeah, yeah. normally question five is, is tough. I mean, but I have been impressed with how many people have been getting the question fives right. We've got some good quizzes. I think we're going to have to make them tougher next yeah. time. So, question five. Which of the following is not a translation of Ola and I've only spelt that phonetically. So, does Ola mean hi in Arabic, hello in Spanish, 
descendant of ancestor in Scandinavian or effort in Russian. One of those is wrong and that's the one we're looking for. Tough question, this one. Very. Remember, we're looking for the wrong one. Again, I'm Not impressed. For our group. They, Again, they I'm very impressed. Very smart, very smart. Yes. Of course, hello in Spanish, it's pronounced hola but spelt with an H, H O L A. And um, the other re really exciting one there is that hola is short for the name Olaf in various Scandinavian languages. So that's where that one came from. But effort in Russian was just absolute nonsense that I made <laughs> up. You just made that up, Owen. Indeed. Well, it was close, so let's see who's won this round. Mm. So on the podium we have in third place, impressive, impressive score, score, Lex. Well, well done. done. Lex. And in second place, Lucy. Oh, Lucy. And Fantastic. massive Lucy. score there in the end for Jess. Jess. Well wow. done, Jess. Well done, Jess. Excellent. So again, I'll cut back to the studio for a moment whilst we set up round three. Um, but what that means is both Emma and Jess, having won a round each, are now both in the potential prize draw. Ooh. I don't know if you mentioned yet tonight that the prize is a £10 Amazon voucher. So it's not just for the fun of quizzing, there is real cash value in tonight. <laughs> okay. So, uh, pin for round three is coming up on screen. Films and TV and entertainment in this round. We've got all five players in again, so let's, let's begin, begin, shall we? So, entertainment round. Which TV program was the first program broadcast on Channel 4? The first ever. Was it Countdown, The News, The Alternative Queen Speech, or was it Ski Sunday? Which of those programmes was the first ever programme broadcast on Channel 4? Ah, uh, very well done. Very well done. Yes, Countdown, the famous quiz Countdown was what they opened with. And I, I don't know about you, but I love a game of Countdown. <laughs> Let's see how, we, uh, how our scores are at the end of that question. So, Lucy and Lex, well done. Getting the right answer and very quickly, competitive scoring there. Mm. So... Question two. Which, oh, who, sorry, has the most UK number one singles? Is it Elvis, The Beatles, Cliff Richard, or Westlife? Who amongst those has the most UK number ones? Uh, I thought people would be tempted by the Beatles. They are a very culturally important British band. Those four are actually the top four, and uh, Elvis has most. Cliff Richard is actually second, and I think the Beatles were third, with Westlife coming in fourth as a tie with a few other artists. So, um, looks like uh, no correct answers actually I do on that one I managed to catch everyone else so <laughs> no change to the score but let's crack straight on with question three which of the following superhero identities is not used in the Marvel Cinematic Universe Vision Hawkeye Spider-Man or Captain America so one of those superhero identities is never said out loud on film. At least not in reference to the actual superhero. 
Difficult question there. Vision, I think probably not a well-known superhero unless you've seen the film, but Hawkeye is only ever referred to by the character's real name or sometimes the Hawk. Uh, but he does nickname his daughter Hawkeye at one point. So that was the correct answer. Well done, those two people. Let's see how the scores lie. Oh, Ooh, Lucy, well done. And Annabelle pull up, pulling up to within striking distance there. But uh, enough questions left for everybody to compete. So good luck, everyone. Question four. Which member of Blackpink is not Korean? Is it Jisoo, Jenny, Rose, or Lisa? Which member of Blackpink is not Korean? This is me showing that I'm still down with the kids in terms of my music taste. <laughs> I'm impressed, Owen. I'm impressed. Four correct answers. Well done. Yes, Lisa is actually Thai. Uh, I think Jenny and Rose were both born out of Korea in, in New Zealand and Australia, I think, respectively. But all three members of remaining members of the band are Korean. So, very popular band at the moment. Let's see how the scores change. Well, it is tight, isn't it? Gosh. Yes. Some very good scoring tonight. And question five is our last question of our last round our of last our last one. night. Yes, it's the last one. And it's a question five that I'd like oh, to go no, a bit not special the for. Five, not the question five. <laughs> <laughs> so, question five. Good luck, everyone. Who first portrayed James Bond? Bob Holness, Sean Connery, Daniel Craig, or George Lazenby? Pay careful attention to the wording of that question. Who was first to portray James Bond? Uh, quite a few people were wise to avoid the now rather poignant uh, red herring of Sean Connery. Oh, yes, yes. my favourite Bond. Yes, he was a very good actor. I like many of his roles. He was the first... Um, actor to portray jo James Bond on film but he didn't portray James Bond first. Bob Holness the famous quiz host from the 80s actually played James Bond on radio. <laughs> what so, a sneaky question that is Owen. <laughs> very tough question to finish with there but lots of people very wisely avoiding the red herring there yes. and thinking maybe it's uh, somebody else. George Lazenby was another very early James Bond. He only played James Bond the once and I like George Lazenby so in third place, we have Annabelle. Well done, Annabelle. Well done. In second place, we have Jess. Well done, Jess. And in first place, getting into the prize draw, we have Lucy. Hello. Very well done. Well done, well done So everyone. again, I'll cut back to the studio and uh, we will do our prize draw. So <laughs> as with every other night, I have the numbers one, two, and three written on a piece of paper, and I will muddle them up and get Brigitte to pick one for me. Okay, so tonight's winner is the winner of round three. So that means, Lucy, congratulations. You are going to receive a £10 Amazon gift voucher. The well practical done, Lucy. Oh, Yes, well done indeed. The practicalities of claiming your prize are when you come here as a student, make yourself known to us and we will verify your identity and credit you with your Amazon gift voucher. So I'll cut back to you, Brigine, for any last comments. I'd like to say thank you for joining us. We've had a really great time. We're going to make sure that all the films about the different subjects are available and you'll be able to dip into them. If you have any further questions, get in touch. If you're interested in applying, we'd love you to. You can apply through our website. So look forward to seeing many of you very soon. Bye for now. Indeed. And thank you all for choosing to spend your time with us on uh, early in the evening. I'm aware we're competing with some good stuff on TV. And everybody's been absolutely lovely in chat and in comp competing in the cahoots. It's been absolutely lovely getting to interact with all of you. So very much in the finest tradition of our lovely Chapel Town students there. So we'll finish off as we've done the last few nights. We've got a little virtual tour our students have put together with, with some delightful copper core corporate copyright free pop for you to enjoy as a little bit of an outro. So um, hope to see you all apply 
Um, thanks for, for being with us, and good night, everyone. Bye.